Hi folks, it is a pleasure today to have Professor Deva Bracha from the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Deva Bracha got his PhD at Stanford in 2004 and he's been working on a whole bunch of stuff uh, regarding network algorithms, uh, message passing and now more recently on social networks as well. Deva Bracha has been eminently successful uh, winning several different awards including for example the Sigmetrics Rising Star Award as well as the airline prize from the Applied Probability uh, Society of the Informed. So uh, here is Deva Bracha. Please welcome. All right. Hey, uh, 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 thanks a lot, Shinivas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you? <laughs> oh, well, that's very sweet of you all. Um, you guys can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So uh, thank you, Srinivas and Kumar, for having me online. And this is clearly an unusual experience. So I may be a little bit patchy in to begin with because I'm not seeing my audience, but hopefully it will smooth out. Uh, of course, feel free to stop me. Uh, interaction is going to only help me. Uh, so let's start with the sort of the topic of the talk. As you can see on the first slide, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, processing social data. So let's just to get the context right, right? So here's what I'm thinking. Those 90s when we had, uh, we were introduced by, uh, to us by internet or web. Uh, some of you may be young, at least looks like from far distance. And then you might not even remember almost like me. But at least by the end of 90s, we sort of started buying and selling things and sort of I'm sure, uh, Somebody like Professor Kumal must have sort of uh, uh, got annoyed because the books were also sold online and uh, now onwards. And then sort of came this lead decade where sort of we got all sorts of social media. Uh, and now it's sort of so much part of our life that sort of everything we do is instantly recorded. It's like our DNA is now available in terms of social data that's collected out there. So if aliens came around and they didn't know anything about us and then they looked at our social data, they would be able to say Thanksgiving is celebrated, turkey is eaten, Fridays people run to shops to sort of buy things, and then sort of uh, people vote for two parties, Republicans and Democrats and so on. So the question is that there is a lot of information that's out there in the data, question is how can we process it? And big issue here is data is uh, highly unstructured and noisy, and it's a huge amount. And so the challenges are of some form uh, at some level statistical and computation. And the question is how do we resolve that? So this is a massive program and what I'm going to do today is I'll tell you a few questions that we have looked at and what sorts of sort of approaches have worked successfully. Okay, so with that, let's start with a specific context. Okay. All right, let's, okay, good. You can see the change of slide. Yes, we can. And you can see our mouse so you can point with it. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. So, uh, so it's a social data, it's data generated by us, not by machines. So for example, you go to an expensive mall or not expensive mall and you buy something, swipe credit card, or you buy something electronically. These data is recorded somewhere. You go to a movie and go come back and do write your uh, feedback on Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb, or you go to a restaurant and look at sort of uh, do review on Yelp, or do any other things. Again, sort of all of these things are recorded, it's available, your tweets, Mechanical Turk, which is a crowdsourcing platform, which I will, talk, I will spend a lot of time in this talk. Um, and then sort of Facebook posts, your blogs, or just your web crawling history. It sort of tells us about sort of what sorts of things you're thinking about. Okay. And now the question is that sort of you've got so much data, as we just, just sort of discussed, it, it does provide us a tremendous uh, opportunity. So, for example, it uh, provides us tremendous opportunity in terms of uh, doing efficient businesses. And um, I think some colleagues of mine in Sloan School here at MIT would call this business analytics, uh, whether it be pricing, revenue management, or advertising. Uh, it does sort of clearly help in terms of improved social living. I mean, now that I have Yelp, if I'm walking in New York City, it's easy for me to find a good coffee shop rather than otherwise. If uh, Congress is looking at this data, maybe they might realize that lots of millionaires are ready to pay a lot of uh, bit higher taxes, in which case it's different laws will be passed. Or in general, you can sort of use this to do consensus building. And if I become really optimistic, maybe we could uplift societies. So of course, we know the examples of the Arab Spring or CNNI report and so on. But uh, I think cloud computation is in, in itself is really an exciting uh, opportunity. So this sort of uh, give us a sense See, by cloud computation, I'm thinking of uh, tasks that can be done by humans, like looking at a web page and sort of deciding whether it's suitable for children to view or not, 
but may be very hard for a computer to decide. It does not require too much skills from people who are performing the task, and therefore humans can perform it very easily in few seconds and get paid in micro amounts. On the other hand, computers can't do it, and we have such tasks that needs to be performed. And all you need is to sort of be sitting in front of an input device which sort of provides you the input of task and where you enter your sort of answers. So if I had sort of refugee camps and let's say I really want to improve them and of course if you look at statistics on uh, UN website or anything, the huge number of people still live in refugee camps. So if I could build a cloud computation facilities there cheaply, of course a big, big technical problem, but suppose I could then maybe sort of uh, life would become much better there. Anyways, that's a lot of high thinking. Let's come to specific question. The question is the following. You got a lot of data and you want to make decision. Decision whether it's a business decision or whether it's a, a computation decision and so on. And the challenge is that sort of this is highly unstructured and noisy data. And the decisions that you want to make are very concrete and specific. So one issue is the statistical challenge. And the second challenge is that sort of it's a lot of it, so it's computationally difficult. The question is sort of how do we sort of try to solve these two issues together in the context of processing social data. And for specific examples that I will sort of show you going forward, is one solution that sort of has worked well, and that is when we sort of put the framework of statistical inference along with message passing algorithm. So the way I want to view these problems is that I want to make decisions. Decisions are variables that I want to learn, but I observe the data. So the question is that how do I learn these variables from my observation? And this is how we think of uh, uh, in statistical inference data. We build a meaningful model. This is where a lot of uh, possibly social insights goes, uh, goes, goes in. We, we build a model that relates data and decision, and then sort of uh, we sort of come up with the right algorithm because hopefully you would know what to do there. The only problem, like most things in uh, life, is that sort of this will be very hard to solve. So uh, by the time we end up implementing this, will be outlived. So we need approximation. And approximations that we need are of the type where the take data is input and produce decisions at output rather than going through actually learning the model. The model sort of serves as a conceptual framework that helps us design the right approximation that takes us from data to decision. And we would like to do this in message passing form so that these are simple distributed algorithms that could in principle be uh, implemented in parallel fashion. So they could deal with large amounts of data. Okay, so now, of course, a plan is as good as its execution. If it can't be executed, then it's useless. And uh, we have sort of at MIT tried to sort of uh, execute this for a few specific examples. One example is crowdsourcing, which I'm going to talk about at length today. Second one is related to decision making and recommendation. Uh, depending on how time permits, you might discuss this decision making. A recommendation I won't be able to discuss. And finally, it's uh, advertising and searching in Twitter, and uh, that's sort of I will have to skip today. Uh, just to give you a few words about the second and third topic, because we're not going to talk too much about them in detail. Uh, by decision making, I'm thinking of something like we have to hire people, unless you have to invite a speaker for a talk, and uh, like this. And of course, uh, everybody would have sort of at least the decision makers would have sort of discussed with each other and definitely I came up on the top of your choice and therefore I'm here. Uh, okay, that was a joke, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, the actually you're the last speaker of the semester. Ouch. <laughs> All right, just, just, just made it to the top list. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, sort of, uh, Possibly the decision would have been that well, sort of these are the sort of end choices, and some of them some people like over the others, and then sort of those things got aggregated. The question is that can we aggregate these kind of things in a systematic way using comparisons, and how we can use comparisons maybe more generally to produce recommendations. So, for example, instead of Yelp having starred data, if you went to two restaurants and compared them, and if we had data of this type collected over time, can we use it to sort of produce good recommendations? At the bottom of it, it's uh, understanding people's choice. And the way we think of choice is understanding distribution or permutations or ordering. Uh, again, if time permits, I'll get there and then I will sort of discuss how in detail we can sort of do these things very quickly. Uh, the other part is related to searching on Twitter and here sort of the idea is that, well, there are tweets and tweets and retweets. 
uh, form some kind of a network structure. And if one thinks of this as a network structure and build the appropriate uh, diffusion model over of the information over this network structure, then that helps identifying influential agents or identifying influential tweets that help searching them. All right. What the main topic is the crowdsourcing, and uh, so sort of uh, uh, it's primarily sort of the situation where I'm thinking of again doing micro task uh, crowdsourcing. I will talk about that in more detail when we get there. All right. So with that in mind, here credits to my collaborators. The the topic of the talk is crowdsourcing is with uh, joint work with my postdoc Sebung O and the collaborator is David Carr who is in computer science department here. Uh, decision making, I'm not sure if I'll get there. It's a uh, joint work with my graduate student, Amar. And more generally, this topic is uh, with a bunch of collaborators listed here. And the uh, topic related to Twitter was with my former student, Tawid Zaman, who will be joining MIT in the near future. OK, so with that, here is the landscape of crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing in generally means a lot of different things. On one hand, it corresponds to something like this. It's a, it's a price which is sort of offered to uh, if the person sort of, somebody manages to sort of design a commercial way to sort of land man on the moon. Uh, of course, there is a Netflix had used implicitly crowdsourcing beautifully by a few years back when they uh, declared an innovation price, a million dollar, and they made sort of all sorts of very intelligent people work very hard and got a lot out of it. Uh, now, these are not the sort of the type of crowdsourcing tasks I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about something at this end of the uh, spectrum, which I would call micro-task crowdsourcing. So what you want to think here is something like, uh, again, an example I gave you is a sort of, is this web page good for uh, children or not? Or you're looking at uh, an image that is generated out of biological experiment, and you want to count, explicitly count, how many red blobs are there in that image and designing uh, good image processing algorithms for such tasks is very hard. Usually, for example, this is precisely the project that is run at Stanford between statistics and biology department. Usually sort of uh, expensive postdocs actually spend time counting those things. What now they do is that they crowdsource it out and they sort of give those images out for sort of to people. And those people sort of count things and provide answers and then you aggregate the information. The problem is the following. If I give you an image and I ask you count how many red dots are there, uh, you might say three. Now, how do I know that it's actually there are three? I will look at the image and I will count it myself, which means I actually perform this task. The tasks are so simple that verification is precisely like doing tasks. So there is no way for me to sort of uh, verify tasks manually and sort of gain benefit of the crowdsourcing setting. The only way to sort of uh, obtain benefit is to actually automate the verification process. And uh, if one can, in a sort of a cost-effective way, automate that process, then there is a gain. And the whole question that sort of we are after is, in uh, in few words, is this: is can we use a, a collection of unreliable uh, workers, workers, or crowdsourcing agents, use their answers, which are unreliable? and somehow aggregate information out of it to uh, create a situation where answers are a lot more reliable. Okay. Let's sort of do a little bit more uh, concrete. So uh, here is an image that sort of you would uh, have seen which represents the crowdsourcing platform. Uh, think of, uh, again, the task of uh, counting, let's say, number of red cells or red dots in an image. Let's say you hired an undergrad as an intern. And that sort of intern is really, uh, really diligent, and you're really paying low cost. This is a low cost, and you got 300 images done. Because intern is really diligent, you got 95% reliability in terms of task performance. Now, if you go to Mechanical Turk, like Amazon Mechanical Turk, and if you uh, ever have used it, you'll find that people will do these tasks for really low cost. Low cost, like less than few cents. A five cents is actually a high number. And in that case, you might imagine that sort of using your $15, you would be able to uh, possibly get 3,000 images done. The problem is that it will be unreliable, maybe 65%. Okay, so 
this is a question whether we want to maybe lose some gain but increase the reliability at the same cost. And this is exactly like classical communication problem. That is, I'm sending you bits. Some of the bits are corrupted. Question is that how can I sort of increase reliability in terms of my message transmission, uh, possibly using more trans more bits to transmit or more time to transmit. In that sort of uh, along in that analogy, maybe I would assign each Turker multiple labels in such a way so that effectively with fifteen dollars an hour. I will be able to get 600 images, not 300, so it's twice, and achieve the same reliability. And the question is, can I do that? Or more precisely, the question would be, given sets of uh, mechanic, given sets of turkers were unreliable, what is the best uh, way to utilize them to get given reliability in the most cost-effective way? So with that, let's start with sort of one example. Just to sort of give you a sense of sort of how a crowdsourcing works, if you haven't seen this before. So let's say I've got sort of this is an actually uh, uh, actually sort of an example that happened um, in 2008. There was a plane that was crashed in Nevada. Uh, it was a, uh, um, it was an Air Force plane, and then everybody was looking for it. Of course, uh, government had images of entire desert. It just that they couldn't sort of uh, find it because there were so many images, and image processing algorithms are not that great. So what they did is that they released millions of images online and then asked volunteers to look at the images and sort of answer whether there is a plane or there is no plane. So it looks something like this. Image, help me find missing plane. If there is yes, if you see one, tell me yes. If you see no, tell me no. So each volunteer roughly would, let's say, see a small batch of tasks, selected three images. And then he or she goes and says, well, I don't see anything here. Maybe there is something here. I want to give benefit of doubt. And there is definitely nothing here. And then another person comes, looks at maybe three other images. Says, well, there's definitely something like plain that's looking. They are sort of, uh, these are not the real images. Maybe there is uh, nothing here. Maybe there is nothing here. And so on. Okay, so at the end of this, I will obtain answers of this type. If I look at this image, all three people have answered me yes. So it looks like there will be a plane. Here, all three people have answered no, so maybe it looks like there should not be a plane. But a situation like this or like this, I don't know what I should do. Uh, maybe I should send somebody to look at here. Maybe I should not send somebody to look at it here. And simple algorithm would be, well, let me ask uh, some number of uh, people and let me look at the answer to majority. Okay? That's a very simple way to sort of resolve this uh, uh, unreliability. As we will see, this is highly suboptimal and there is much better uh, that's a thing that we can do in this kind of setting. Okay. Right, so maybe here is where I should pause and ask a question. Is sort of broadly sort of the setting of crowdsourcing uh, understandable or, or feel free to ask something here? So, so one question there, right? So the additional aspect here is you can make it much more interactive. That is correct. So there are, you can make it interactive in two ways. One is given answers uh, of people. You could actually iterate between answers and your estimates for tasks. Second is you can actually sort of ask people questions one by one. And so sort of there are two interactions with the algorithm part and sort of assigning questions. So for example, if uh, we'll come back to this later, that is, suppose initially I got for this, uh, let's say this uh, image, I got two correct answers first. Maybe I don't want one more answer here because I'm already confident. But if suppose here I got first answer incorrect and second correct, maybe I want to assign one more person. And we'll sort of look at that dimension of interaction as well. We have a question? So, uh, sorry, so, um, yeah. um, no, so you don't assign any weight on the viewers. If somebody has good reputation of uh, identifying things, or somebody keep uh, the opposite in mind, or you can probably do some of the uh, referencing on that one. Uh, that's that's a great point. Uh, so um, here, sort of, I'm assuming that sort of these are the this is the crowd that I don't know anything about. Uh, this is roughly how crowd is available on Amazon right now. But we will sort of start thinking about how to even sort of start building reputation. Right? I mean, um, at some level, we build the reputation based on the historic answers. And hopefully, sort of near the end of the talk, maybe I will uh, try to uh, convince you that maybe there is one way in which we can start building reputation cumulatively. Great question, actually. 
Okay, so it's not a further. Let's sort of just summarize. Here are the question. Here is the goal. We want reliable estimation of tasks with minimal cost. Cost is nothing but effectively number of edges that are there, because each time you ask a tester to perform a task, you have to pay five cents. Roughly speaking, that's how I'm going to do it. And operational questions are how to do task assignment. That is, which tester gets which tasks. And once we got answers, how to infer the correct answer for the task? Okay. And again, sort of as uh, Kumar pointed out, there is sort of an iterative version of a task assignment that can be even taken care of. So to begin with, we'll just assume that given set of sets of tasks are given, given tasks are given, and we'll try to assign them. Later, we will sort of look at the iterative version of it or adaptive version of it. Okay. So. Before sort of I give you the results, this is just a preview of results in one particular setting, in the setting of the example that we started with. So remember, if each character is asked, or each image is asked by, to only one character, then a label is correct with 65% chance or 35% error. That's the point I would put here. And no algorithm can do really better than that, because no, no redundancy. Right? Now, what here in graph, what I'm plotting, is under appropriate model as image number of image or number of redundancy or each image how many times answers questions are asked on average as it increases probability of error decreases and this is an oracle estimate that we have calculated this is like lower bound and we'll see how the lower bound comes if we did majority this is what we will get there's a variation of algorithm which sort of people have used in practice heuristically, and this is the sort of uh, the best of those answers that comes. And this is the answer that we get. Okay, now, of course, one can ask, is it good or is it not good? Uh, I would like to convince you that this is pretty good because of the two reasons. One, you see this is a log log plot, or rather log plot on error and sort of linear plot on images. The slopes here are distinct. And it's the slope that matters, and that really sort of determines how many sort of things you need for a given reliability. For this particular chart, if you say that let's say I want 90% accuracy, if you use our algorithm, then you will need eight um, eight answers per image. If you use best existing algorithm, which is EM, you would use 12, is one and a half times. So if you should think of this as the money. It's like a billion dollars and a billion and a half dollars. And then sort of this one, which is more than two billion. So clearly sort of you want to do something like this. Okay, so that was the preview of results. Now let's sort of start with uh, uh, concrete answers. So first I'm going to uh, tell you the answer to the task assignments that we do. Then I will tell you the inference algorithm. Before I tell you the inference algorithm, I'll have to build the model to sort of tell you where the algorithm is coming. As we shall see, the algorithm doesn't have anything to do with the model itself. And for that reason, for any setting it applies. And we will sort of run some actual experiment, or I will show you some results from actual experiments that we run on mechanical turf using that algorithm. And then sort of we'll discuss some theory. Okay, so that's roughly the plan. First, I will give you the answers for algorithms with the model. We'll see some experiments, and then we'll see some results. Okay. All right, so task assignment, extremely simple. It's as simple as it gets. So, what I will do is, given number of tasks and given number of tasks, let's say I have a budget, a budget of L, L answers per task. Then I will do LR regular graph, five part graph assignment. So, if I have as many tasks as as many workers, then L equals to R. Okay? And really, sort of, I could do that, I could choose that because in, uh, as, uh, somebody who has used mechanical search, you would know that you can actually create your batches the way you like. So what you can do is that effectively, you choose one subset of batches and ask somebody to perform that. Then you choose another subset of batches and ask somebody else to perform and so on. There's no really sort of limitation on how many people you are. Okay, so going forward, we will sort of think of L equals to R, but uh, for generality, I'm just leaving that like this. Why do we use this? Uh, well, on one hand, it's locally tree-like. Locally tree-like, the graph is because two reasons. One, because it's locally tree-like, it, in my opinion, it allows maximal information aggregation. 
and that is the reason why it leads to sharper analysis as we will see later. On the other hand, if I thinking of as a communication person, it's, it allows for, for me to get high signal to raw noise ratio. Roughly speaking, as we shall see, uh, the answer that I'm looking for in this noisy setting boils down to the largest singular vector of certain matrix, which is a noisy matrix. And if I use the way I have created the matrix like this, there's a regular bipartite graph, it is essentially a good expander, and because of that, the gap from my signal to my noise is as large as possible. Okay, so that's uh, roughly the reason why I'm, we are using this and it, it works out very well. Okay, so now building the model before I sort of, uh, uh, we go to the algorithm. Uh, excuse me, uh, I've got a question here. So, so here you have a fixed number of uh, batches, you a fixed number of people. Uh, if that number is changing over time, some people show up, some people, uh, uh, more people are like, interested, or more people drop out, you, then you would, you, you cannot change the number of batches uh, to adjust that effect, can you? Uh, no, so here sir, I'm assuming that I'm going to sort of put these batches online and I will wait till enough number of people perform that, right? And the way uh, on Amazon usually it works is like this, that sort of you put each batch is a task, roughly speaking. You ask sort of somebody to perform that task, when the task is performed, you pay that person. So can you have a scheme that the varying number of batches increase, you can also uniformly generate random regular bipartite and then increase the resolution as more people show up, or few people show up, you can still have some good convergence on that. So really the way, uh, assumption really that there's an infinite pool of people here, because if you, uh, I mean, the number of people is not really sort of limited. There's huge, huge population who will be ready to pay, uh, take your task. So what I think what he means is uh, supposing you want more information on some particular subtask, you may want to put a larger degree for that one task. Sure, sure. So then, sort of, then you're asking me a question of adaptivity, right? Right. And uh, let's hold on to that because it's an interesting uh, setting, and I want to discuss that in a little more detail. So pardon me for sort of uh, uh, delaying the answer to the question, but uh, hopefully I will answer it in an interesting way. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, um, so that's the um, um, setting of how task assignment is done. Now moving to the model. Uh, so here's sort of I'm thinking of as a simple model. Um, each tester, unknown to me, has some reliability. The reliability is given by probability of that being correct. Okay? So, for example, this tracker has reliability half, which means that he or she is going to answer the task correctly with probability half, incorrectly with probability half. And I'm thinking of tasks here as binary for simplicity. There is a sort of natural way to think of uh, higher alphabets, but let's think of, stick to binary. Plane is there, plane is not there. So each person answers the task's question correctly with probability that is given here. In this case, it's half. So given that it's half and given this binary setting, really this person answers are essentially random, like conflicts, to use that. More generally, I'm thinking of each worker has probability TJ or Turker has probability TJ associated with it. And he or she answers, if he or she is asked task I, he or she will ask correctly with probability TJ, incorrectly with probability 1 minus TJ. And these are independent given the TJs and TI, okay? So really sort of, this is a simple, simplistic model as it gets to begin with. Okay, and in this setting, what I'm going to assume that sort of I do know a prior information that, that there's some of the reliability, for average of some of reliability greater than half or not less, or not greater than half. In some sense, it's necessary assumption because think of the following situation. Suppose all TJs are zero or all TJs are one. There is no way for me to differentiate between these two things unless I know this one bit of information. Okay, so really sort of this is not an assumption as per test. So this is my model. Once I put this model, I could think of the best algorithm. And the best algorithm is this Oracle algorithm. So let's think of our, uh, algorithm in the following situation. Suppose <coughs> there's a person with very high PJ. That's a PJ close to one. Then that person's answer 
should be sort of what I should look at, right? And what I'm doing is I'm just taking a weighted majority of that those weights computed as per log likelihood multiplied by the sort of answers, and I'm just summing up and taking the sign. Effectively, it says that well, if all PJs are equal, then I'm looking at the majority. That is, uh, for example, in this case, let's say this is the task I. I see three answers, plus, minus, minus. Majority will say, let me sort of take out of these three things, majority is so minus one, minus one, plus one, which is minus one. Sign of that is minus one. And that's why it will be um, uh, uh, the majority thing. Of course, if different pages are, if pages are different, then sort of Oracle would say you weight their answers differently. If there's a person with sort of extremely low incorrectness, which is PJ equals to half, then this is close to zero. But Oracle would not reduce the weight of that person or increase the weight of person depending on their PJ. And uh, there is a quick uh, question. You need feedback for this, right? To say whether the guy got it right or wrong. Good. So this uh, this answer is totally feedback free, right? It just takes the data. Mm. Hence it's implementable. This is Oracle answer. So only if you as an Oracle know the PJs, then you can answer it. Okay. So that's why this is the lower bound. Best you can do. And this is the achievable scheme. And the whole question is that where do we stand here, right? And the point is that sort of we have an iterative algorithm which iteratively tries to estimate these reliability, which are sort of surrogates for these things, using the answers. And then sort of it obtains an estimate of this as this answer. And it does extremely well. It does extremely well here, as you can see, sort of in picture for a specific model. But as we'll prove theorem, this is this algorithm's performance is as good as the optimal algorithm. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, there are many functions that meet this requirement. Why pick log or QPI or one minus QPI? Is there any particular reason this function is picked? And you call it Oracle in lower bound. And this is the maximum likelihood estimator. Oh. So if you think of, uh, let's say, just estimating plus one, minus one, and a priori you don't know whether it's plus one or minus one, but you do know that sort of uh, whatever the answer would be, it will be answered correctly with probability pj and incorrectly with probability 1 minus pj, then this would turn out to be the right answer. All right, thanks. OK, no problem. So in some sense, what we are trying to do is that we build a model to find out what is the right thing we should solve. We will build a surrogate towards solving that, but we'll use the data and we'll produce an answer. Okay. And uh, how does the algorithm work? Roughly speaking, it's a message passing algorithm, and it is an approximation of maximum likelihood estimator, as I say. So let me give you the intuition rather than precise algorithm. So here is sort of how it works. Okay, so let's focus on things one by one. So suppose, let's say that I, for some reason, I know reliability of everybody. So let's say I know that sort of uh, Srinivas is highly reliable, and you know that I'm highly unreliable, for a second. In that case, Srinivas's reliability would be close to infinity. My reliability would be close to zero. In that case, let's say you as a task person, you want to estimate a task. What you would do is, uh, OK, so there's, OK. You as a person who want to estimate task, this is highly reliable Srinivas. This is highly unreliable me. You will multiply this answer by that person's weight, multiply this answer by my weight. You will sum that and produce the likelihood for this task. Now suppose sort of you already produced the likelihood of tasks. Can I sort of use this likelihood of tasks to estimate my reliability? Well, some other people, based on other people's answers, sort of I, I obtain likelihood for the different tasks that I have answered. The I'm a Turkle J. These are the tasks for which I have answered the uh, question. Somehow from outside the world told me that this task is plus one, this task is plus one, this task is minus one. But I have answered this task as plus one, I have answered this task as minus one, and I have answered this task as plus one. So really, this is an agreement, this is disagreement. So more disagreement, less is my reliability, less agreement, so more agreement, more reliability. And that would in some sense lead to this kind of summation. So what I'm iteratively doing is that, 
first I start with the reliability that say that it's equal to zero for everybody. Then I will compute the surrogate answers for my tasks. That is like a majority. Okay. Then what I will do is sort of I will using this task estimate, I will try to estimate my reliability. But then using this reliability, I will try to estimate my task again. And I will keep iterating these things. Okay. And the way I'm iterating this is in a three way manner. That is, in order to estimate the reliability of me for this particular task, I'm using all tasks other than this. Okay. And similarly, in order for me this for this task to tell this circle what it thinks about sort of uh, what is the answer of this, it will use the answer from other turkers. So if you look at these equations and if you forget this not equal sign, then you might just remember that this is like power iteration method. A power iteration method for A transpose. Where matrix A is matrix of answers. Okay. So if you do not have this inequality, really tasks are sort of converging to the largest singular vector of uh, the matrix A and similarly sort of W that is converging to the largest singular vector from the other side of the matrix A. Okay. However, of course, we have this not equal and that changes the role a bit, but in fact, the entire sort of machinery boils down to showing that really that is uh, that's sort of largest singular vectors are what are computed by these algorithms. And in fact, actually, it's really important that we have this not equal because by having that, actually, accuracy becomes even better than before. So, if you had run the power iteration algorithm, it won't be as accurate, at least provably, it won't be as accurate as the accuracy that we get using this tree like algorithm. Okay, so that was about the algorithm. And this is sort of uh, fits into this plan of you take answers. You have a model to sort of tell you what sorts of algorithm you should use, but you produce answers directly. Okay, so now as I promised, these are sort of um, this is an algorithm you can directly run on any setting and see how well it does. I mean, we have a model to prove theorems, but there's a reality to check how well it does. So initially, I thought was well, this is the type of question we'll ask. Here's the type that I wanted, but I have these two types. Which one should I wear? Well. Or maybe something like this. This is more interesting. Here's the shirt that I want to wear. Like the shirt I'm wearing right now, maybe you can see it. But this is the shirt I'm wearing, and here are two ties I have. I don't know. I'm not. I don't have good aesthetic sense. So maybe you could tell me which tie should I wear. Because I've done this experiment, the problem is that it's hard to verify what is the uh, what is the true answer, right? Because this is sort of utilizing the eye of the world. So we decided to run this experiment. This experiment is the following. We show a color and then we give them two different colors and ask which is color, which color is closer to the shown color in the top. Okay. And there are uh, cognitive distances that are well known based on the hex code of colors. So we use those things to sort of decide the answer. So there is a sort of a well researched area on, uh, on sort of how, to how people perceive sort of similar things for as far as colors are concerned, and we use that as a, as a test. And then we yeah, end up. Yeah. Just as a matter of interest, Suja has joined from UT Austin and he's colorblind. So you have a point for him. <laughs> hey, uh, Suja, so this is, uh, I don't know if I can hear your voice, but you can hear mine. This is blue, this is light blue, and I don't know what this is called. But this is not light blue. And the answer to the question was that which of these two colors is like this, and of course, then hence that. All right. So we ran these kind of, these kind of questions. And then here's what we obtain. As the number of tasks increase, the error goes down with uh, our algorithm in this way, with majority in this way, and EM algorithm in this way. So it's sort of uh, interesting to observe that EM algorithm, though it was doing well on synthetic model, does worse than um, on actual uh, setting. And this is sort of uh, empirically observed by various people who, uh, in the in the interest in this topic area. Effectively, EM algorithm is very sensitive to initial condition you start from. Unless you start from a very good initial condition, you are likely to perform very bad. Okay. Now, so this is sort of uh, just to explain that we use random graph even to run this experiment. 
statement, but suppose we did not run random graphs, what would have happened if we had used graphs with smaller spectral gaps? We used sort of graphs with geometry, essentially locality, and that sort of led to poorer performance. This is to explain that really spectral gap does matter or randomness of the graph is useful. So, and this is with real data, so there are no theorems here, but it does seem to sort of have all the two properties that we were expecting. That is, algorithm starts performing better and graph structure does help. Okay, so now the question is of what can we prove about it? Seems like it's doing well on a synthetic experiment. It does seem to well doing well on real experiment that we I showed you. Can we sort of uh, figure out why it is doing well? And uh, interestingly enough, there is one parameter that really matters. And the parameter is what I would call the cloud quality parameter. The first go, one might think that, well, maybe it should be the difference of speed from half. But it's a difference of piece from half in this precise form. It's a second uh, or weighted second norm of this empirical uh, PJ. Is you take everybody's P1, P2, Pn, take 2P minus 1 square, it sort of measures how far these P's are from half. Of course, if all P's are half, then this is bad, this is zero. If all P's are zeros or one, then this will be the largest possible, which will be one, and hence sort of Q will be one. So this is higher the Q better it is, lower the Q work it is. And here is sort of uh, what you can actually prove. It's really sort of an interesting phase transition phenomenon that when Q is the cloud parameter times L, which is the degree or redundancy per, uh, per task. So think of L equal to R. When Q and L increase, when it's less than one, roughly speaking, then actually information aggregation is not useful. So you should run majority voting algorithm. It's like what's happening is that when QL is less than one, what you are aggregating by running the iterative algorithm is noise rather than signal. And so it is not worth sort of aggregating, but just run the majority voting. But when QL is greater than that threshold, aggregation starts helping. Okay. And one can formally prove this theorem that is, uh, uh, and here's the theorem statement that when you should read this as q square l square greater than one, roughly speaking, and you use appropriate random, this LR regular random graph. After k iteration, probability of error is what fraction of tasks you got incorrectly after k iteration of the algorithm. k is like e to the power minus ql, which is how much resource you have put in, normalized by crowd quality divided by something which is the constant effectively. So if you pass this precisely as A goes to infinity, this goes to four. Okay, so you should think of this as Q times L divided by eight. So really this is precisely how the error is quantified. And uh, when sort of we, we can actually do a lower bound. So this is how upper bound is. Ignoring this one, it's QL divided by eight. This is the error that you get when you use our algorithm. There is a min max lower bound that you can improve, which says that error must scale like e to the power minus QL. Okay. This is a small order term, so really this is the thing that you want to focus on. Uh, there is a quick question. This yes. is, is this like a large deviation thing or a central limit theorem thing? Um, excellent question. It is, uh, um, okay, so. Let's see what is scaling here, right? So this is in large system limit as n goes to infinity. But for as n goes to infinity, what fraction of algorithm, what fraction of uh, answers are incorrect for any k? And this, in that sense, is sort of um, a mean field kind of limit, if I would think of it. Does that help? So effectively what it's saying is that as n becomes large enough, after k equations, or well, k is large enough, let's say you can take it 10, as you can see sort of from this, you don't really need k to be very large to sort of have a small constant, constant close to four sitting here. So when, after finitely many equations, for n large enough, 
a fraction of questions that are answered incorrectly by your algorithm scales like e to the power minus ql divided by a. So if q is very large, sorry, if q is very large, then the number of redundancy you need is small. Or if q is small, the amount of redundancy you need is large. And here is sort of an algorithm, here is a sort of result which says that if you use majority voting, then it's an order of magnitude worse. So I'm, I'm thinking of Q as something like 0 0.01, for example. Then L scales like 1 over Q here, L scales here like 1 over Q squared. So just uh, to sort of put everything together in the perspective, what this uh, result tells me is that if I want to achieve reliability 1 minus epsilon or fraction of uh, stars that are answered incorrectly, epsilon, then redundancy I need is how many times should a task be answered should scale like one over the quality of the crowd times log one over epsilon. And the lower bound tells us that actually that is necessary. So you can't be better than that. And in some sense, this lower bound is obtained using Oracle. So really it says that there is no significant gain in using any side information, be it worker reputation and so on and so forth. And uh, because sort of Oracle would know the worker's reputation, right? Like PJs. Mm -hmm. And any special questions and so on and so forth. All of those things which people all, all the time think about are not going to help. At least up to if we, this is the metric that I'm interested in. Right. Now, okay, so bottom line is this sort of uh, majority is an order of magnitude that worse, and there is a reason why we see the slope like this. This algorithm is as good as Oracle, and that's the reason why slope is a thing. Our conjecture is that this one over eight should be actually one, and the effect is that sort of reflected in the slope close to parallel to this. Uh, David, go back to your previous slide. This one? No, the O, the o versus big o, omega. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know. Uh, you're saying that L is big O, that means L smaller than that is sufficient? That is correct. Right. I mean, I thought L should be at least that much to be sufficient. Okay, uh, okay so I guess. So that means I can choose L equal to zero? No, no, no. Okay, good. So yeah. it should be theta. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's sure. okay. Okay, so what I meant is that uh, there exists one L which is sort of uh, satisfying this. So, for example, this one would tell us that L should be. 8 over q log 1 over epsilon. Okay. And uh, this one would say that just L should be 1 over q log 1 over epsilon. Okay. Now, coming to the uh, more interesting question Do adaptive tasks help? Like going back to the uh, earlier question that Kumar asked, saying that, well, let's see that this person gave me these answers. This person gave me these answers. Now, after this, I realized that I've got consistent answers here, consistent answers here, consistent answers here, and here. Maybe all I should spend my budget on asking on questions for these tasks. Okay? And then I will just ask the person to sort of answer these questions and so on. So, this is like a completely adaptive scheme. If you take some tasks, ask question to somebody, then take another set of tasks based on the answers you've seen, ask somebody, and so on. Surprise is that actually it does not help. It does not help in the following way. The expected budget that is required in the min max setting is must scale as 1 over q log 1 over epsilon in order to achieve 1 over epsilon, in order to achieve accuracy of 1 minus epsilon. Just to go back, here what they said is that if we did everything in one shot, 1 over q log 1 over epsilon was sufficient. What this says is this is a lower bound saying that adaptively there exist sets of PJs and uh, answers so that no matter what you do, you won't be able to get accuracy better than epsilon by any algorithm without spending this much of budget. Uh, there was one, one question. In communication theory, yes. if you have uh, feedback, then you get uh, doubly exponential convergence. Oh, great question. You know, this is the question we have been wondering. There is, so in feedback, right, channel capacity does not improve, but error exponent improves. 
And the question is that is there some connection here between this and those uh, results? And we don't know. I mean, those are great questions. You're sort of. Uh, I don't know if sort of, uh, I'm answering your question that you wanted to ask. You know, uh, yeah, that's it. So if you don't have feedback, it's exponential. Otherwise, it's doubly exponential. So I don't, yeah. So in some sense, here uh, having feedback in adaptation way is not helping at all. Anyway, so that was sort of a, it was a major surprise to us because there's a huge sort of a community in the designing crowdsourcing system which have been sort of going uh, uh, have been a strong proponent of asking people to design adaptive versions. And if you have played with uh, these crowdsourcing system, adaptivity is very hard to implement because of time delay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, at some level, this actually says that okay, maybe adaptivity will help, but only by constant factor. Okay, so now sort of a few last bits of uh, insight that sort of this gives. So suppose I have a crowd. Crowd has sort of this is the uh, quality given by the crowd. This is the cost it may has. This is the quality of another crowd. This is the cost they give me. Which one should I choose to work? Now that we know that sort of everything depends only on the quality Q, I should compute Q for this crowd. I could compute Q for this crowd and just take the maximizer ratio. And that's the crowd I should employ. Very simple, greedy investment. One might wonder, well, how do I learn this Q? Because in a sense, uh, here, a priori, I would require to know Q in order to do error, right? Well, here is sort of, at least in, the, for the, in this model, there's a sort of simple, uh, uh, simple algorithm which could even sort of achieve the same guarantee without knowing the Q. So algorithm roughly would go like this. You start with some candidate Q, say Q equals to one. And then you sort of design L for that and obtain answer. Then you sort of double the Q, okay? Or rather half the Q and then double the L. And then you solve the answer again. And then you see sort of how much is the uh, agreement between them. If the agreement is of the order same as epsilon, then sort of actually you got right answer. If not, repeat. And then sort of uh, one would sort of be able to prove uh, a theorem that sort of actually this is the right way to sort of uh, uh, learn uh, rather iteratively discover a few of the crowd. Uh, but how about how about something like bootstrapping or analysis of variance or things like that? Can they be used to estimate a Q? Mm, that's a great question. Um, uh, so at some level, we would need to know. Uh, whether there's, okay, so if we repeated, let's say, Q and 2Q, and we saw some kind of agreement between answers, let's say I designed two experiments, one with uh, one Q, other with another different Q, and I have estimate answers for one and estimate answers for other, and if I saw a significant overlap of answers, that will tell me that sort of there's a high chance of answers being correct. And that can help sort of bootstrap possibly. And that's certainly the type of uh, adaptive scheme I'm thinking about. The nice thing is that sort of the, because dependence on Q is linear, sort of this kind of doubling argument does not sort of uh, yield extra cost. It is up to orders. Anyway, so I guess. Uh -huh. Okay. No, I, I, I share Kumar's uh, uh, question. Uh, when do graph learning, we have seen see some exponential reduction number of courage to uh, uh, do adaptive versus non-adaptive. But there's a major difference here. I think in there, if you have more sophisticated information, you need to narrow down the focus search area to guess the up. But here, it's a very simple yes and no a binary function and no more structure to explore. So it looks so flat, and you don't gain much by focusing on this. But maybe that's, that's no, no, you, so you're probably right. So at some level, sort of uh, the setting that I'm um, considering here has sort of um, a few few drawbacks. Drawback one, assuming that sort of every circle is uh, is homogeneous. Drawback two, every task is homogeneous. Okay. Drawback three, which is sort of alphabet being binary, but really that's not an issue because one could think of um, every finite alphabet is yes, no, and then sort of it's just k times the problem. So it's not that bad. 
Goodbye, Brian. I mean, there's, there's no depth. There's only, only one bit of information. It's not something we could narrow down. The binaries, the tree binaries, you can go to different branches and focus on certain branch, ignore other branches over here. The two shadow, I think it's just one level. There's no, nothing further to be, to be divided here. That, that's what I mean by binary right here. Hmm. The amount of information or the function that you're trying to learn, it, it's, it's very shallow. That, that's the way I was trying to say it. I don't know if that's right, but that's just what, what I thought of this. Converse, a uh, very good answer was that. Mm -hmm. But going forward, I think sort of some of the things that sort of uh, mm -hmm. sort of well thinking about are mm -hmm. the heterogeneity of uh, heterogeneity of tasks and cloud. Like for example, if there are two types of questions: questions which are difficult questions and questions which are easy questions. Or people who are sort of uh, really good experts and not so good experts. Now, the second one, without the heterogeneity of tasks, again falls into the same framework because the PJs are different. And we never assume anything about PJs to begin with. Yeah, was... It's a sort of the first version, which is the heterogeneity of task is difficult. If you assume sort of two types of heterogeneity, really, at some level, we are solving here rank one problem, a rank one approximation of the matrix. To solve uh, with heterogeneity of two, one has to solve a rank two problem. And sort of a similar qualitative results would carry over there. So um, can I ask you a question? So I think this adaptive scheme, it's a little strong to me because you assume that epsilon is same for all of the tasks here, right? No, no, so okay, so. For, for some of the images, for the no, some no. Of the, right? The, the way I define probability of error is, um, um, so you take number of, okay, so, Let's say here is what you do. You have n tasks. Uh, they have their answers. Let's call it all one. Now you have an algorithm which produced estimates for n tasks. Let's say sort of there among n answers, one minus epsilon fraction of them are correct, epsilon fractions are incorrect. Then I will call that is probability of error epsilon. And that's exactly and that's all the requirement is here. Right, but what I'm saying is among the probability of error is this is what you want is, let's say you want 1,000 images to be classified. For each image, this probability of error is different. Okay, so then what will happen is that sort of, uh, this, this result would sort of look something like uh, epsilon would be the average of those errors. Right, okay, so, so, what, so adaptive schemes with that where when you're producing less error, then it may not be as much necessary for budget. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, I'm, all I'm saying is that sort of actually theorem extends to that setting in the sense that sort of if you put epsilon equals to sum over, sum over all epsilon i divided by n, then sort of you will require this much of uh, this much of uh, budget. Am I uh, am I communicating in the sort of the sort of setting right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's like, it, this is a setting where I cannot say, let's take this offline. Because okay. we are already. <laughs> hey, can you talk up? No, I have a question about that. Supposing yeah. I choose one of the epsilons to be super, super small. Yeah. But I choose the others large. It seems to me that then I will, my budget will have to increase a lot, even though the average is the same. I mean, for example, take one of the errors, I want epsilon to be zero, and the other one, error one, right? Mm -hmm. I have an infinite budget. Yes. The error yes. may be half. So uh, why does it depend on average? So I think sort of, okay. Uh, um, okay, so sort of uh, what, what uh, the way I will define error is that sort of, I will not sort of, um, um, I will define the fraction of things that I get incorrectly, right? So you're doing a probability of probability of some sort. Exactly. Like a pack, pack learning kind of thing. Okay. Exactly. And that's why sort of it's uniformized. And of course, in some sense, this is a lower bound. So really sort of it applies to that setting. It is that, as you said, that, low, that precise lower bound might be sort of much larger than this one. And if, if let's say two people say this image has a plane, yes. the probability that uh, that image has a plane is pretty high. The error likelihood is low. Yes. There is information there in the feedback. Yes. 
So if you want to drive this uh, aggregate probability to whatever the target is, to me, this seems like there's information and feedback. Correct. So you're right. So the information and there should there. be some gain with that. So the gain says that sort of this theorem says that the gain is only up to constants, not up to the major parameters. Okay. So you're perfectly right. There is there is information gain. There should be information gain. So that will be silly. The only point of this theorem is that it is bounded in this way. So I think I'm sort of already seeing the clock and I'm already, I think, over time. So why don't I sort of conclude? This is what I want well, to show you. There's no uh, real uh, you know, constraint on our side. Uh, so we don't want to keep you there at infinitum, but uh, we have budget until 5.30 to at the least. So, so, um, so I, I do know that sort of people's cognition sort of stops. So. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I mean, I don't know, sort of, of course, myself is sort of, uh, over, uh, how about sort of I take a, a, a short poll? I mean, I can go on for very quickly 10 minutes and I can stop here. And of course, don't be polite. I mean, it's okay for me to stop. And So, Devra, so the idea is this. So, yes. uh, in lieu of uh, flying, uh, driving, coming over here and so on, we have an extended discussion. Okay. okay. So, over at this end, we have uh, cookies for people to help themselves and over at your end you're already eating something. So <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think you're fine. Yeah. I got yeah. a message cookie. So yeah. Okay, so it's okay, take your ten minutes and then we'll have some discussion. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna be very quick. I will just tell you the sort of a, a story rather than sort of any uh, result and then sort of we'll have the discussion. All right. So uh, uh so this part is about sort of again um, thinking about sort of comparisons and idea is the following just sort of uh, in many settings, like recommendations uh, or decision making, what we have done is that sort of we have uh, tried to sort of make humans answer the questions the way machines can process them well, rather than the way humans can answer well. So here is an example of that thing. So let's say sort of I give you this blue color as you're seeing on your screen. I've given you a hexacode also, so that you can help me answer the question like on scale one to ten, how blue is this? Actually, they have, we have two screens. It looks bluer on one screen and <laughs> less on the other. <laughs> so, so the, this is perfect. She was identity of this question. <laughs> so I remember his question and just sort of. Uh, I mean, I, I go to orthopedic and then they, they look at. I got sort of uh, recently. I got tendinitis because I was sort of uh, being childish while sort of climbing uh, wall climbing, and so I went to sort of uh, my orthopedic and he said. Tell me sort of your <laughs> pain on the scale of one to ten, and I was looking at him, and so I asked him, you know, really, if I, I didn't have unbearable pain, I wouldn't come here. So really, I have a problem. And then I re reminded him that you know optometrists do this pretty well. They ask you to see sort of two glasses, and then say which one looks better. And so soon you ask now, irrespective of the screen, hopefully you will be able to answer me, which blue is more blue. Yeah, I, I would say the left one, yes. Great, thank you. So as Srinivas also said, depending on the context, scale changes, but sort of comparisons usually does not change. And in some sense, comparisons is the way we think about things easily. It's more absolute way for humans to think rather than sort of scales. Scales are sort of nice and useful because computers can aggregate them well. But comparisons are sort of the way we think. So maybe computers should ad adopt to us, not sort of we should adapt to computers. Okay, and that's effectively the point of uh, uh, this project that we have. Uh, so I'm picking up again sort of classical recommendation setting like Netflix. You sort of rate a movie like Inside Job, and you get recommendation of waiting for Superman. You're depressed, <laughs> and or let's say you want no, to sort of hire. Sorry, there was, uh, I don't want to interrupt, but that's the time. So you think the doctor should have hit you on the leg with a hammer and said, uh, was it as bad as this? <laughs> no, no, I mean, maybe so if they had my, they had my history, uh, they could sort of have looked at it and say, you know, what sort of, uh, uh, did you have pain while sort of walking before and walking after? I'm not suggesting a solution, I'm suggesting a problem. <laughs> but you have a point, uh, it needs a solution, and instead of solving doctor's problem, I'm going to try to solve the recommendation problem. 
Sure. All right. So, so let's say hiring decision, you sort of interview different candidates. Uh, there's uh, 10 candidates interviewed. There are 20 people who can interview, but not every candidate is interviewed by everybody. So what you could do is you could apply the scores to every candidate and then take aggregate of that. Or you could say, well, among the four candidates I see, I like this over that, and that over that, and that over that. And maybe try to aggregate those things. But uh, of course, currently sort of possibly we do something like this. Questions that can be used comparisons to do aggregation. And uh, that's the type of question I want to answer in the next six minutes. So just to remind you, current approach like Pandora style, you like this song or you don't like this song. And when you don't say anything, you're not even giving any information. Of course, it's nice because it's easy to sort of add up how many likes versus dislikes, and then sort of that tells you which one is better. Or rating, as we just explained. Again, it's very nice because it's easy to aggregate. So both of these are nice. This is both of them are easy to aggregate. But this is too coarse. I mean, it's like, like or not like, maybe I want to know a little more. And maybe that's why Michi suggested that we should go beyond good and evil. Um, this one is a similar problem. It's effectively coarse because really, sort of, if you, uh, it's a well-known statistic that Netflix has movie ratings that are mainly one or three, sorry, not one or four or five. There are a few twos and threes. So really, sort of, people do sort of aggregate around things. And also, it's mood dependent. At times, sort of, um, depending on mood, you might change rating. Hope is that maybe comparisons might be less mood dependent or less screen dependent. And so if I give you two things to compare, and let's say you compare this one, and then I give you two other things, you can compare this one, and I give you this thing, you will compare this one. And in this nice case, maybe you could sort of put the ranking together. If I like this over this over this. So of course, this is uh, this is nice for various reasons. It's publicly available in all sorts of data, whether they are your web clicks, yet you'll be watching, browsing three movies on Netflix, and one of them you click. Sort of saying your soft liking toward that, you turn to a transaction and buy a certain pair of shoes. Among the shoes that you saw on the shelf, you're already saying that uh, this pair of shoes I like more over others. Whether you like more or not, it doesn't matter. All that matters to me as a business, you're ready to buy that versus others. And in terms of that's what I want to do. Problem is aggregation is hard. This is the age old problem. I mean, just to give you an example, let's say somebody rated A over B, somebody rated B over C, and then somebody rated C over A. If I look at first two things, it will suggest that A should be greater than B should be greater than, and A should be greater than C. The last one contradicts that. In a sense, these are the type of questions that people have sort of studied and tried to answer and construct paradoxes out of for, uh, for a long, long time. So the question is sort of how to resolve this issue, because we are not going to resolve this because there are impossibility results. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of give you a reasonable answer that will sort of help us sort of going forward. Okay, so reasonable, one way to think of this is to say that, well, these are not coming from one order, like the way Samuelson suggested in 1938 in part of his uh, axiom of revealed preferences. Instead, I would say that there are distribution and each one of them is an instantiation of that distribution over permutation. So the way I want to sort of think of these things coming as partial preferences of this distribution, it's 25%, it's this thing, the rest of the 75%, it's this thing. And this is one way to fit distribution. There are many ways to fit distribution, but let's sort of for a second say that given partial preferences, I could fit a distribution consistent with observation. Then what I will do is I will use this distribution somehow and maybe make some ranking or aggregation. The big question is that how to learn this and then how to do this. And ideally, you would like to go from here to here. Okay. So at some level, this is what we want to do. Now, just again, seeing the time. Okay, I'm going to sort of stop in a minute. So there are issues like arrows and possibility results, which says that even if you learn distribution, there is no interesting way to learn things subject to certain uh, actions. What our proposal is, well, there's a reasonable way to learn it. And in the sense, this is exactly consistent with all sorts of model learning that people anyway do in practice. Okay, and the uh, answer is very simple. I'm just going to give you sort of uh, in words what answer is. 
let's suppose that you learn the distribution, then I'm going to find for every item what is the average position rank of that item. Let's say for the distribution, let's go back to this example. Sorry for yes. In this setting, this item is ranked in position one 25 percent time, position three 75 percent time. So its average is average position is one times one fourth, three times one fourth, and so on. And lower the score, better it is. Higher the score, worse it is. Okay. So that simple sort of uh, thing, as it happens, this is the right thing to do in the sense that a class of models that people use in practice, like in practice, like Microsoft TrueSkill or uh, in chess ranking, what they effectively do, like in chess grandmaster scores, effectively they're trying to learn parameters of models and then use them to do that. I'm suggesting let's not learn the distribution. We just run the, this thing directly from the data if we can. Then it will be consistent with all the things we are already doing in practice and a lot more. We don't really need to restrict ourselves to model learning and then assign things. But we just take the data and produce the scores. And here is how we can do that. Particularly if I have comparison marginals, then it's sufficient statistics to produce this course. And that was the that is the main point of this part. So I think there's a sort of a demo that we have here to show, show the group's decision making. You can email me and I can email you back if you like. Bottom line is that sort of there are all sorts of data, there is social data, a lot of opportunity, but issues are statistical and computational, and there are a few examples where we have try to resolve this issue successfully and they sort of uh, built on statistical inference and as passing algorithm. All right, so I think I've taken way longer than I should have. So thank you for your patience. Thank you very much.